Hello, Itochi. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. I'm here. <laughs> Very good. Uh, George, whenever you want. Yes, so it's five o'clock. Uh, we should start with a new session. Uh, and we have to be very much on time this time because at six o'clock there's the public outreach talk. So we should keep strict timing in this session. So Pablo, please begin with your talk on the even lighter axiom. Okay, so good afternoon. I am Pablo Quilez and I am a postdoc at DESI. And I am very happy to be here today with the Invisibles family. So thank you very much for the invitation. And also thank you very much for putting together this really nice workshop. Today, I'm going to talk about this project and even later QCD action in which we have explored the possibility of the true action that solves the strong CP problem to be much lighter than the canonical invisible action. And this is based on these two papers that we have written in collaboration with Luca Di Luzzo, Belen Gabela, and Andreas Rinkat. So in my opinion, the QCD action is one of the most motivated uh, theories beyond the standard model. And the reason is that it is a really simple theory that basically involves one free parameter, that is the, the action decay constant. And still, despite its simplicity, it is able to solve two major problems of the standard model. It was originally proposed to solve the strong CP problem, but then later on, we discovered that it also constitutes an excellent dark matter candidate. And the action is a rather old idea from the 70s and the, and the 80s, but still, it, it is still very much alive. And unlike other dark matter candidates, the, the relevant region of the parameter space of the axon paradigm still remains largely unconstrained. Only ADMX quite recently started to prove the, the relevant region. However, in the next decades, this is going to change dramatically. There's now a really strong experimental program that in the, in the near future will either discover the axiom or exclude large regions of the parameter space, as you can see here with all the different projections. This means that this is a really exciting time uh, in which it is, it's really nice to work on axiom physics. So let's, let's go back and remember why, why are we interested in the axion? Why, why the axion solves the strong CP problem? When we look at the Lagrangian of the standard model, we see that one of the three parameters is the so-called theta parameter that, that is here uh, together with the GG dual term. And this term breaks CP in the, in the strong interactions. And therefore, one can measure this parameter by looking at observables like the electric dipole moment of the neutron. Now, the surprising thing is that when we measure this parameter, we find that it needs to be smaller than 10 to the minus 10. And this is basically the strong CP problem. Why this parameter that should be of order one is so small. Uh, one of the most elegant solutions in order to solve this puzzle is the so-called action solution. And at the end, this solution that was proposed by Peche and Quinn boils down to the following observation. If the, if the theta parameter, instead of being just a number, were actually a scalar field, then the non-perturbative dynamics of, of QCD would generate a potential to the action that uh, force the action vacuum expectation value to, to lie in the CP conserving minimum. This means that whatever theta parameter I start with, the action will take a vacuum expectation value that exactly renders the theory CP invariant at low energies. And as a byproduct of this solution, this, this Petsequin mechanism, we, we need to introduce this new particle that is the action. And one of the most robust predictions of, of, the, of the QCD action is the mass of the action. That is basically the second derivative of this potential. And any theory in which the, the action only couples to, to QCD as a confining group will have this, this formula in which the action mass is inversely proportional to the action decay constant. 
Now we can look at the invisible uh, axion parameter space. And here I am plotting the axion coupling to photons with respect to the, to the mass of the axion. And since the axion is a Goldstone boson, also the coupling to photons will be inversely proportional to the axion scale. This means that traditionally the, the invisible axion models lies, lie within this yellow band. And any other point in the white region of the parameter space corresponds typically to what it is called an axion-like particle. That means uh, a particle that has similar properties to that of the axion, but that doesn't have anything to do with the solution to the strong city problem. Now, uh, given this strong experimental program that in the near future is going to test large regions of this parameter space, I think it is important to wonder whether this is really a robust prediction of this paradigm. And, and it is important to wonder whether there are other possibilities and whether uh, an axion that lives in the white region of the parameter space could actually solve the strong CP problem. And actually, this idea has already been tried. And in fact, there are several papers in the literature in, in, in different works that have tried to either enhance or suppress, for example, the axion coupling to photons. And this corresponds to moving the axion band vertically, either upwards or, or downwards, typically by, by, by modifying the Wilson coefficient that sets the strength of this, of this coupling. Another possibility is to move the QCD axion band uh, in the horizontal axis. And indeed, this has been also pursued in the, in the literature by building, by building heavy action models in which new confining sectors are responsible for these extra contributions for the, for the mass of the axion. However, little effort has been devoted in exploring the, the, the last possibility. That means to explore uh, lighter actions. And, and in fact, this is really interesting given this program because it is precisely all this region, the one that will be proved in the, in the future by, by all these experiments. And then on top of that, I think it is also you know, interesting to, to explore these different possibilities because there will be some connections of these non-minimal actions with uh, solutions to other problems of the, of the QCD action paradigm. Like for example, the Petsay Queen quality problem. So before going to the specific framework in which we're going to try to build this kind of light actions, let me follow the advice of Chanda. And I'm going to ask two questions within the invisible action paradigm in order to see how these questions will be answered differently once we take into account these, these new frameworks. And the two questions are, could Casper Electric phase one detect an action? And the second one is, can the QCD action be fuzzy dark matter? So Casper Electric is an action dark matter experiment that aims at detecting at a time dependent, a time dependent uh, electric dipole moment of the neutron. So as I was telling you, in order to solve the strong CP problem, it's crucial that the action needs to couple to the Gigi dual. And unavoidably from this coupling, we, we obtain a coupling of the action to the electric dipole moment of the operator. And in this case, there's no extra Wilson coefficient that you can play with. And therefore, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this coupling and the coupling to the EDM. And moreover, since it is also this coupling, the one that is responsible for the action mass, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the action mass and the action coupling to the EDM. This is why it is relevant to wonder how could one interpret a positive signal of Casper Electric phase one, let's say, for example, for, for this value of the coupling? So if we measure something here, we can use this formula to see which uh, action decay constant it corresponds to. But automatically, with that action decay constant, the action will be much heavier and therefore out of reach. This means that a priori, this region of the parameter space is somehow unphysical and, and an action uh, could not explain a positive signal in this region of the parameter space. Then let's go to the second question. Can the QCD action be fuzzy dark matter? In order to solve some, uh, some small scale structural issues of the cold dark matter paradigm, uh, some people have proposed that a really light boson could be the dark matter. And by really, by, by really light, I mean of masses of 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 20 electron volts. 
And since this is also a really light scalar, it is natural to wonder whether this fuzzy dark matter could be the, the QCD axion. However, once we put the numbers with the, with the mass of the axion, we can easily see that you need a transplantian decay constants in order to generate such a light axion. So therefore, this means that the canonical QCD axion cannot be the fuzzy dark matter. So now I'm going to present you this framework that is based on some ideas that already Anson Hook presented on, on the talk of Monday. And I'm going to show you that actually it is possible in a technically natural way to build an action model that solves the strong CP problem, but it, that it is much lighter than the, than the usual formula. So let's go back to the action potential. As I was telling you, it is crucial uh, in order to solve the strong CP problem that the minimum of the action potential corresponds to the CP conserving point. Therefore, in general, it is really dangerous to, to modify the potential of the action because in general, you can spoil the solution to the strong CP problem. And as a consequence, we need somehow an alignment. And if we need, if we want the action to be lighter, we will also need some cancellation between this unavoidable contribution from QCD. This may seem something completely fine-tuned, but as I, as I will say, show you next, it is possible to do it with asymmetry. Let's imagine the following situation. Let's imagine that we have a full copy of the standard model that is related with the standard model via a set to symmetry. And however, the action is shared among these two worlds and transforms non-linearly under the action of the set to symmetry. If we impose this symmetry to the Lagrangian, what we obtain is two copies of the standard model that are completely degenerate and they have exactly the same spectrum and the same interactions uh, as the standard model with the only exception of the theta parameter that will be shifted by a factor of pi in the mirror sector with respect to, to QCD. If now we look at the potential for the action, we need to add the two contributions and what we obtain is that indeed the total potential for the action, uh, we get a partial cancellation among the two because of this shift and the resulting action is lighter. However, this set to action cannot work because it predicts a theta parameter of pi halves and therefore this does not solve the strong CP problem. However, this general framework, this general idea can be easily extended to a sudden symmetry with an n number of walls. That again, these, all these walls are completely degenerate and have the same masses and interactions as the standard model with the only ex exception of the theta parameter. So now we can play the same game and we can add all the different contributions and we indeed get that if n is odd, we do get a minimum in zero. And therefore we solve the strong CP problem with a really late action. And in particular, one can see that the mass is exponentially small. So as I was telling you before, this, the, uh, this mechanism was proposed by, by Hook three years ago in a completely different context. He was interested in solving the hierarchy problem. However, this idea can also be used for to get lighter actions. And this is what we have explored in these works. So now let's understand a bit better why this cancellation takes place and why this action has an, an exponentially small mass. If one add all, if, if you add all the contributions from, from the different sectors, naively one would expect that the mass of the action grows with the number of worlds, like this formula. However, this is not the case. There's some degree of cancellation and there's an easy way of understanding why this cancellation is taking place. So if, if we look at the, at, the, at the total potential of, the, of this axiom, we see that at the end we are adding up the same functional dependence, but with a different shift here depending on the different sector. So now we can multiply and divide by this step, and now we can easily recognize that this sum is nothing but a Riemann sum. And therefore this Riemann sum can be expressed as the corresponding integral plus some subleading terms. Now, the interesting thing about this kind of sedan symmetric potentials is that the integral does not depend on the action. That is, this integral that is basically an integral from zero to two pi of a periodic function adds up to a constant. 
This means that the potential for the action is contained in the subleading terms. The bottom line is that now the total sudden action potential is fully contained in the error that you commit when you substitute the sum, the Riemannian sum, by the corresponding integral. And there are really powerful theorems that tell us that for reasonably well-behaved functions, this error, this cancellation, is exponentially small. And in fact, we, one can apply all these powerful theorems for the case of the action that depend on the holomorphicity properties of the action potential. And one can see that indeed the resulting action mass is exponentially small and the parameter that controls this exponential suppression is nothing but the ratio of the light quark masses, m up over m down. Um, so we also developed on the mathematical properties of this potential and we were all we were able to show that that the total axiom potential corresponds to a single cosine and we were also able to make the sum of this potential and and obtain a compact analytical formula for the axion mass in this model. So now once we know how to compute the mass we can look at the phenomenology. And what we find here is that uh, these orange lines correspond to the, to the prediction of this sudden action for a different number of, of n. And as you can see, we are populating all the region to the left of the, of the QCD action band. And within this paradigm, even the region that will be proved by ALPS2 could, could be an action that solves the strong CD problem. On top of this, we were also able to build two UV completions of this framework. And in one of them, that is similar to the KSV set action, we found that in a large region of the parameter space, we also get an improved Pacheco inequality problem. So, 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 sorry, we get an improved Pacheco inequality. That is, that the Pacheco inequality problem can be easily solved due to this sudden symmetry in, in all this region of the parameter space. Then uh, on top of this, let's say, naive phenomenology, there are also some novel bounds that we can put on, on this extremely light action. And these novel bounds come from finite density effects. So as, as I have already commented, the, the total action potential uh, that we can see here is extremely suppressed as a consequence of this cancellation between all the different contributions. This means that is if we are in a in a medium of in a, for example within a stellar object with high density, then the contribution of the standard model will be suppressed, and this will break explicitly this sudden symmetry. And as a consequence, the cancellation is broken, and we get an unsuppressed potential. And moreover, now the minimum is no longer in zero, and we get a minimum in pi. And this has, this has a really important impact because this means that in the surrounding of these stellar objects, the theta parameter won't be zero, but would be pi. And as a consequence, we can put some bounds from the sun and also there are some projections from neutron stars, for example. And on top of that, the fact that the action has a different BEV inside these objects also generates long range interactions. And, and this implies that we can use gravitational wave signals that come from, from binary in spirals in order to constrain this action. And here we can see the different projections. And, and, and this shows that this um, idea is quite testable. And by the way, um, this situation is already changing because this week there was this new paper by Juan and collaborators in which they already analyzed real data of LIGO and now some part of this region of the parameter space that were projections now are real bounds. So some part of this region is already excluded now. Before going on now to dark matter, let me, let me say one caveat of this framework, that is that the total action potential actually has several minima, not only theta equals zero. This means that we only solve the strong CP problem with a one over n probability. So this is worse than the canonical axiom, but still is an improvement from the usual tuning of the strong CP problem that is of 10 to the minus 10. So once we have understand that there's this mechanism in order to get really light axioms, it is interesting to wonder whether this extremely light axiom could also explain the, the dark matter. 
And, and indeed, we have shown that, that this extremely late action can, can, can be produced in the early universe and that the, the way in which it is produced is different from that of the usual action. So let me briefly review, review here the, one of the non-thermal production mechanisms of the, of the action, that is the misalignment mechanism. It's about five more minutes. Okay, thanks. So yes, yeah, so since I have five minutes, let me, let me skip a bit this, the review. So the only thing that I want to say here is that in order to compute the action relic density, that is basically an oscillating scalar field, uh, it is important to know when the action field starts to oscillate, because the moment at which the action starts to oscillate will determine when we start to, to have this dilution factor. So, but then what happens with the sudden action? So, similarly to the finite density effects, what we find is that at finite temperature, we obtain something similar. That is that at large temperatures, the potential is not suppressed and we have a minimum in pi. But then when the temperature becomes of the order of lambda QCD, we get the full cancellation and finally the zero temperature potential is developed. So this peculiar temperature dependence of this action will make that the, the relic density, the action relic density prediction will be quite different from that of the, of the usual action. And this is what we have called the trapped misalignment mechanism. The idea is the following. At high temperatures, the minimum is at pi, and therefore the action starts to oscillate around that minimum. And it is not until lambda QCD when the action is free to oscillate around the true minimum. This effectively means that there's a delay with respect to the usual misalignment mechanism in which the action starts to oscillate when the, when the mass of the action is of the order of the Hubble parameter. And as a consequence, since, since we delay the onset of oscillations, there will, there will be less dilution and therefore more dark matter, as we can see here with the larger amplitude of the action oscillations. Moreover, we, we also realized that in some regions of the parameter space, this, this trapping, the fact that the action first oscillates around pi, can source the recently proposed kinetic misalignment mechanism. The idea is the following. At, at large temperatures, the action starts to oscillate around pi. But then suddenly, at lambda QCD, the full potential develops and if the, if the action velocity is large enough, then the action can overcome several potential barriers sourcing this so-called kinetic misalignment mechanism. And, and the consequence of the action going over the barriers for a long time effectively delays even further the onset of oscillations. And therefore this also results in a, in a larger relic density. So taking into account all these different effects, we, these are the results in which we have, we have obtained that in this purple region, the, this extremely light action can explain 100% of the dark matter relic density in all this purple region. So now we are ready to answer back the two questions that I, I was asking at the beginning. Could Casper Electric Phase 1 detect an action? So now we have broken this usual relation of the action and we have a new free parameter that is this number of walls. And moreover, we see that in this region of the parameter space that will be probed by Casper, we can produce 100% of the relic density. So therefore we find that as far as we know, this is the first technically natural model that could explain a positive signal in Casper electric phase one. And similarly, this also constitutes the first fuzzy dark matter model that solves the strong CP problem because we are populating this region of the parameter space of with masses of 10 to the minus 22, 10, 10 to the minus 20. So with this, I arrive to my conclusions. In this talk, I have present you a proof of concept that the QCD action can actually be even lighter than the usual action. And this sudden action is the first of such examples. And this, this motivates interesting regions of the parameter space that will be soon proved by, by, by different experiments. And moreover, this action can also be the dark matter. 
In particular, we have also identified a novel production mechanism that is this trap misalignment that in some regions of the parameter space can source the kinetic misalignment. And now let me end up with some caveats and outlook. So of course, within this scenario, n copies of the standard models is non-minimal. So it would be interesting to, to see whether this can be embedded in a more UV completed framework. And it is also a caveat that we only solve the strong CP problem with one over n probability. And regarding the outlook, I, we, we have identified this new trap misalignment mechanism that actually can be more general and it can also arise in other, uh, in other models. And, and also we have focused only on the zero mode. So, so it would be interesting to study a possible axion fragmentation in this axion um, in this kinetic misalignment. And in this sense, I really encourage you to see the poster by Philip Sorensen that they have been exploring this, this idea. And also this can be used, for example, to not only for dark matter, but also to generate a kination era as Pera has presented us this, this afternoon. And with this, I am done. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Pablo, thanks a lot for your nice talk. And um, we're open for questions. Uh, Enrique, you have a question? I, I was just clapping and uh, <laughs> admiring. Ah, sorry, but... I, I'm oh, shocked I by this flash to the past. <laughs> yes, Laura, I have a question. Uh, yes, so I, I have a question regarding, so if you have many uh, minima, uh, what, what happens about the domain wall problem? So uh, do, you have a, do you have any solution for that in, in this model? Yes, yeah, so in, in, in our analysis, we were focusing on the pre-inflationary scenario so that then in, in our parts of the universe, we, we were starting already from only one initial misalignment, right? But it is true that since you have several minima, that, that could be a problem. However, it's not completely clear for me whether this model has a, a domain wall problem, because as I was telling you, in most regions of the parameter space, you will always first go to pi irrespectively of where the initial misalignment was. So then what one would need to study is whether you reintroduce the, the, the domain wall problem in this kinetic uh, misalignment era. And in fact, this is an interesting question that in fact, I think that the, the group of Philip Sorensen that I was commenting together with Geraldine Servant are studying whether the action fragmentation that you could generate in this um, in this kinetic period could produce large enough fluctuations in order to make different regions of the universe end up in different minima. So yeah, that's a good point. Okay, Arturo has a question. Hello, by the way. Hi, hi, Gary. Um, thank you for the very nice talk, Pablo. Uh, I have a, a question. So, um, you, you said that with these mirror words, you introduce um, copies of the standard model. Right. So my question is, uh, these this copies of the standard model would be sensible to gravity. So like, would they have an impact on the dark matter abundance? Ah, yeah. So that's a, so in fact, so when starting this project, I, I realized that there's actually a lot of literature of people considering these mirror worlds. Right. And indeed, that there's a lot of papers that have tried to explain dark matter through these mirror variants, for example. Because at the end, since you have a full copy of the standard model, you will have the equivalent variants, right? And pilots, etc. And, and yes, there are people that are trying to, to explain dark matter in this sense. However, it is not trivial because, so something that I didn't have a lot of time to comment is that in order to evade the bounce on an effective, you need that the temperature of the other walls is smaller than the standard model temperature. So if you want to generate dark matter, you have to manage to generate a, a baryon asymmetry in that sector that is really large, right? In order to generate a lot of dark matter while still having few photons and neutrinos. So this is non-trivial, but indeed there's some papers by Bereziani and, and also Maurizio Gianotti that they have uh, pursued this, this idea, yes. But we're focusing on explaining dark matter with the axion, but one could try a multi-component dark matter in this sense. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have finished to finish this here. Uh, Pablo, can you um, un unshare your screen?
And yes. thanks again for your nice talk, of course. Thanks. And now we move on to Hitoshi. Can you share your screen? Perfectly, here it is. So Hitoshi, please tell us about these super, I think, superconducting cosmic strings. Exactly. So you can, you can start. Hello. Yes, we hear you. Do you see it full screen? We hear, we hear this is screen, we hear you. Just okay. go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Welcome. All right, Welcome, so, by the way. so I'm, I'm giving uh, a talk about basically two papers I, I put out uh, with recent, recently, one with uh, the Brooklyn Post of Hajime Fukuda and Ofi Talem, together with Anosh Manohar from uh, San, uh, San Diego, and it's going to be published in JHEB soon. Another one with also two postdocs in Berkeley, Jeff Pro and Nick Dorbrod. This is now accepted physical review D for with the editor's suggestion. So the uh, first of talk, my talk will be actually second paper on cosmic axion background and second part on the superconducting axion string. So all of you have heard enough about axion already, so I'm gonna skip this. And one of the motivation for the axion, of course, is the fact that it's, it's supposed to be generic in string theory, could be dark matter, could be, so in general, we can talk about axion like particle as the previous speaker already talked about. So it is actually interesting to sort of generically think about how we may be able to detect axions through the couplings we normally assume when they are actually not part of the dark matter and they're relativistic. So that actually brings up to this question of whether we can detect cosmic axion background. And there are several sources people did talk about of, of the relativistic axions. One of them is purely thermal, namely that if axion does couple the QCD, of course that gets populated by the early quark gluon plasma, and, and that would be still present in the universe today. That is what is called a thermal axions. It may be, the axons may be produced more recently in a universe when there is some kind of dark matter that can decay into axions uh, in the galactic halo. Or at the, at some topological defects like strings or domain walls could decay into axions. So one can talk about these possibilities as well. In the case of thermal axion, I have to say that it's actually very difficult to detect because of this very low temperature. So uh, the, 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 it, it is believed that the thermal axion indeed is produced. And depending on the decoupling temperature of the axion from thermal bath, like TeV, MeV, and the current temperature, you, you predict a different spectrum and the size of the, uh, the axion background. And uh, the, you know, the, so something like the current temperature, of course, is immediately excluded by delta M and effective. You might say that the decoupling temperature on MeV might be actually preferred if you want to explain, quote unquote, the uh, H naught tension. Uh, but anyway, so these are the possibilities. And uh, one can ask the question whether they can be detected somehow. Another uh, source of the relative axion I mentioned already is the potential decay of some dark matter, scalar dark matter that could decay into a uh, two axions, for instance. For example, if you go to some supersphetic models, you always have saxion in the model and saxion preferentially decays to two axions. So that's one candidate theory that actually does that. So if chi, a scalar, is a dark matter in the galactic halo and that decays to two axions, and the axion would have a monochromatic spectrum, which is just a half of the mass of the dark matter. On the other hand, the, 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 ax, the dark matter in the other galaxies at a higher redshift would have also decayed into axions, and the axion from those sources have redshifted by the time they, re they reach our Milky Way galaxy. So they would add up to give you this continuous spectrum. And of course, lower energy correspond to higher redshift where the axions emitted from dark matter decay. So that's yet another potential source for the relativistic axions. And finally, if you have an axionic string, then that would lead to a substantial axion emission that have been known for already for many decades. And again, depends on the decoupling temperature and axion decay constant, but uh, it does lead to this kind of rather broad spectrum of axion energies due to the nearly scaling behavior of the, uh, the cosmic strings. So having talked about these various sources of the potential accurate of the axion universe today, the question is the technical one, whether we can detect them. So the only coupling we assume for the purpose of detection is the usual coupling of axion to E dot B for the electromagnetism. And the kind of detection strategy people do talk about is the case of axion as a dark matter in the galactic halo. So in that case, the axion is more or less at rest 
with relative with low velocity, uh, which is given by basically the, the motion of solar system in a galaxy, a very velocity in a Milky Way galaxy. So that the axion comes with a narrow frequency and the frequency of course corresponds to the energy of the axion using the Planck constant and energy is given by the rest energy of the axion plus the kinetic energy. And because the velocity is much smaller compared to the speed of light, then this second term is rather negligible compared to the rest energy. And therefore you would expect the axion signal to come with a frequency, which basically corresponds to the rest mass of the axion. And there is a little bit of spread due to this uh, velocity profile, which is actually substantial, even though it's 10 to minus six in the energy, uh, given the high, very high Q value of the cavity experiments people are talking about with the incredibly narrow range of the resonant detection. So the axion experiments do focus on this very narrow frequency range to look for the resonance and scan the resonant frequencies in looking for the axion. But as I mentioned already, relativistic axion tends to have a spectrum that is spread out in frequencies because their energy is now spread out. So it can hit multiple resonant frequencies in this kind of experiment when they scan. So the signal is not focused on one particular run with one resonant frequency, but turns out to be common over a range of resonant frequencies during the scan. And interactions need to be worked out also without assuming non relativistic motion of the axion because they are relativistic. So we have to actually look back at the equation's motion in what way the electromagnetism can couple to an axion when you don't assume that they are necessarily non relativistic. And so we talked about the frequency over here, which basically corresponds to the energy of the axion. But when you do an actual experiment, you're looking at a time domain instead of frequency domain. So in the case of dark matter axion, what are you looking for is the fact that axion field is coherently oscillating with a fixed uh, time interval, namely that corresponds to frequency, which is the mass of the axion. And uh, you can ignore the spatial, the, the, the relative of the axion in the relative limit because the spatial derivative corresponds to the momentum, which is the mass times velocity, which is already suppressed by 10 to minus three. Therefore, the axion field is more or less homogeneous within the range of the space we consider in the detection, and it's only oscillating in time, and since you expect this kind of a modulation in time for the axion field, which basically corresponds to Bose-Einstein condensate of the axion particle with a macroscopic occupation number. But instead, if you think about the relativistic axion, which has, for example, the Gaussian distribution in velocities, then Gaussian basically leads to a white noise kind of spectrum. And if you go to time domain, it does look noisy like this, but there is actually a signal buried in there. So the question is whether you can pick that out. If you look at the axion emitting from cosmic string, as I also showed earlier, it has rather broad spectrum over the range of the frequencies. Again, if you switch to the time domain, you expect this kind of the signature in time signal. Again, the question is whether you can pick out the axion signal from that. So we have to go back to square one and write down the Maxwell equation in the presence of the axion field. As I mentioned, the axion coupling to electromagnetic field is given by GA gamma gamma A and B dot E. And then if you actually write down the Maxwell equation in the presence of that term, you find these additional pieces that involve the axion field as a source in the Maxwell's equation. And when you make a non relativistic approximation, as I mentioned already, that spatial derivative means spatial momentum, which is suppressed by the velocity of the axion, and therefore you tend to ignore those. And you are only picking up the time dependence of the axion field as a source of the electromagnetic signal. And that's the way you actually derive various uh, signals on experiments. But we can assume that in this context, because the axions may be non relativistic And if they're non relativistic the spatial derivative, which is mass times the velocity, is as important as a time derivative, which is a mass itself. So we have to keep all of these terms in the discussion. And you have seen this kind of picture already many times on the range 
of the experiments that probe the QCD axion. We are not necessarily talking about a QCD axion in this part of my talk, but anyway, so there's a still wide range of prominent space we would like to explore, for example, using ADMX experiment. So if you have the ADMX experiment already running probing the dark matter axion, can you actually also pick up with the Vistic axion at the same time? So that will be the discussion for the remainder of the first half. And this is the ADMX, this is Haystack, and these things are based on the resonant cavity experiments. So in this case, what are you looking for is a detection of individual axion coming into the magnetic field, converting into a single photon that gets captured by the resonant cavity. So it doesn't require coherence of the axion field for this purpose. Even though people do assume it's coherent, it doesn't matter for this kind of experiment. On the other hand, for the uh, Casper electric type of experiment, you really have to pick up the axion field oscillating, which gives you the time dependent electric dipole moment of the neutron. So in this case, the coherent nature is actually very important, which you don't have in the case of this incoherent relativistic axion experiment. On things like abracadabra and the dark matter radio, you can still pick up this kind of relativistic axion signal. So once again, you are looking for the source of the electromagnetic field of the axion time dependence. And by having this magnetic field, this axion depend, the time dependent axion field would act like ax the time dependent current in the toroidal magnet that would give away to the time dependent magnetic field, which you would like to pick up by squid or something. And this time dependence is still there. So you can hope to do a detection of relativistic axion in this context as well. So if you think about this dark matter decay source of the relativistic axions, you're talking about this dark matter decaying to relativistic axions. And then you do have this, uh, the spectrum of the axion, as I mentioned already earlier, which consists of the monochromatic peak for the galactic source and the long tail from the high redshift sources. And uh, this is again the time temporal signature where you hope to pick up. And it turns out that you can actually do so for a range of the decay lifetime of the dark matter axion. And another interesting possibility here is that of course dark matter signal is dominated from the decay towards the galactic center. And if you have an axion detection experiment sitting on the surface of a planet that rotates towards the galactic center part of the day, and it moves away from the galactic center for the rest of the day. So you can expect actually daily modulation in a signal, which again would be a very interesting signal to look for. Finally, back to the situation with the cosmic strings, then depending on the uh, decay, uh, 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 the, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the temperature of the uh, decoupling of axion, you can actually expect this kind of sensitivity looking from uh, the abracadabra experiment, assuming the 100 um, uh, cubic meter of the volume, where you can do better than this delta effective limit I mentioned earlier and cover part of the prominent space. So the, uh, the basic uh, the summary and the money part of this part of my talk is that you, have, you can think of a variety of sources of the relativistic axions, which you hope to detect, and in the case of the source from uh, the uh, dark matter decay, then you do have sensitivity for a range of the, the dark matter lifetime of, uh, by the ADMX experiment. And for those Gaussian sources and cosmic strings, you expect to have some, some sensitivity in a DM radio experiment. So the relative axions uh, should not be at least ignored. And the ADMX people have already expressed interest in coming up with different analysis strategy to pick up this kind of signature because as I said already, it's not limited to a particular bin in the resonant uh, frequency scan, but it's actually common to many actually uh, scanning frequencies and that kind of signal had not been looked for in the data set. So in principle, that kind of signal could be right now hidden in the data set, which is waiting to be picked up a, by a new analysis technology technique. So this is the part of the, uh, the conclusion of the first half. The, the cosmic axon background detection is not easy. We haven't certainly not detected cosmic neutron background either, but in principle, this kind of signal may already be hidden in the current data. And it, the Tomo axion looks actually very difficult as you saw, but there's a potential possibility for detecting the axion from dark matter decay and strings. And I emphasize again, that requires different analysis strategy and their potential daily modulation is a good signal looking for that. 
Now switching to the second half of my talk on axion string, an axion string had been talked about again for many decades, but it turns out that somehow had been forgotten that axion string is generically superconducting. And I also tell you what I mean by that. So in this part of my talk, I'm specifically talking about a QCD axion. And I don't need to remind you the axion is actually a number goes from boson of spontaneous broken U1 particular symmetry. And if we have the simple spontaneous breaking of U1 symmetry, generically, that would create a cosmic string by the cable Zurich mechanism. And for this, it requires that the symmetry breaking happens after the inflation to make sure that the strings are not inflated away. But at the same time, we also know that u one pitch queen symmetry has to be a normal under QCD, otherwise it doesn't solve the strong CP problem. The strings are ultimately unstable and they all decay. And if there's an exact non-normal ZN subgroup of U1 aperture increase symmetry, I, okay, I see that there are 10 minutes left. It would also lead to domain wars, which is the question uh, Laura Covey asked already. So we have to avoid that because the domain wars will dominate the universe that will lead to a disastrous situation as far as the cosmological evolution goes. So what that means is that we cannot have an exact non anomalous Z2 symmetry, which immediately excludes DFSZ axion. So for the purpose of this talk of having this axion string present and produced after inflation, you have to assume it is case VZ axion. And in particular, you have to assume a minimal Pechequin fermions of just one triplet so that there is no non-anomalous exact ZN symmetry and therefore no domain walls. The only thing you get are axion strings. It has been well known that the strings would reach a uh, nearly scale invariant behavior because the string energy is proportional to the length. And it starts out with this complicated network produced by Kibble Zurich mechanism. And it's trying to simplify itself. But as it tries to simplify itself, new strings come into the horizon from outside, which may also have a different configuration. So it has to keep simplifying itself, eventually reaching this uh, nearly scale invariant behavior. When the strings cross and reconnect and loops disappear, then that will lead to the energy release in the form of both gravitational waves and also axion emission. And it has been known that gravitational A wave emission is subdominant co compared to the emission of axion itself, because obviously axion is coupled by one of the decay constant, which is much lower than the M Planck, which is the coupling of the gravitational wave. Nonetheless, recently, the uh, uh, Yano Kui and collaborator pointed out that gravitational wave emission may not be totally negligible depending on the Petri Queen symmetry breaking scale. So this should not be ignored as a potential gravitational wave signature in the future searches. On the other hand, as I mentioned already, the energy emission into the Petri Queen axion itself, uh, the goldstone emission is definitely dominant over the gravitational wave emission. And they are both subject to some limits from N effect already, but there's still a range of parameters that is yet to be explored within the interesting range of pitch increment scale. Anyway, that's a side story. And the rest of the discussion is really what these strings actually do. So if you take this case VZ axion model, I'm sorry? Five more minutes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have this minimal model with only triplet heavy quarks in it and Petri Queen symmetry breaks and that produces the axion string. And around the string, axion field goes from zero to Fa times two pi, and that's the cosmic string. And once you integrate out the massive quarks and that generates these usual couplings, both to the GG twiddle of QCD, as well as FF twiddle of electromagnetism, depending on the electric charge of this massive triplet quark you integrate out. And given this, additional term of AFF twiddle for QED. And if you again look at the electromagnetic current, you get a new contribution that just by taking the derivative of this effective Lagrangian with respect to the gauge field of U1 uh, electromagnetism, which has the contribution of F twiddle, namely B field times the gradient of axion. The point here is that the gradient of axion doesn't vanish at the center of the, uh, 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 the string. So if you naively take the versions of the electric current, that will pick up actually the uh, del mu del nu of A, which is delta function at the center of the string. Therefore, it doesn't seem to be conserved. And that's of course a problem because we want electromagnetism to be consistent theory with a conserved electric current. 
So we somehow need to deal with this delta function source of the electric uh, current, uh, which is located at the center of the string. And this is actually not a paradox because whenever you actually have this apparently non-gauging behavior, which has to be canceled by a long distance physics, namely that that implies the massless chiral fermion on the string that cancels this anomalous effect. And this is a very similar situation to the edge state in fractional quantum hole effect and uh, the bulk Lagrangian consists of the uh, churn simon theory. Engage derivative of the churn simon gives you actually a F mu nu on the boundary, which is canceled by this massless chiral fermion, which is running around on the edge of the quantum hole state, which is actually chiral anomaly, which violates the gauge invariance, and they perfectly cancel against each other. Namely, the presence of the apparent chiral anomaly guarantees the presence of a massless fermion which should cancel the anomaly, and therefore the presence of masses fermion is required. And if you go back to UV description, the presence of such a massless fermion is nothing but the zero mode of Peche Quinn fermion massive Q, which is localized on the string, which had been known from these people. But somehow this had been only focused on this kind of formal theory community and not percolated much into the phenomenology community, but we need to understand the phenomenological consequence of that. So having this massless fermion, which is chiral on the string, leads to this idea that axion string generically is actually superconducting. So massless chiral fermion on the string leads to this behavior that divergence of the current is actually localized on the string, which is a proportional to the source, which is given by the electric field. So once there's an electric field along the line of the string, and that would actually induce the uh, electric charge that builds up over time. And because this is actually a massless fermion, the amount of charge buildup is uh, equivalent to the amount of the current that is induced. And this equation is nothing but the London equation for superconductivity, and hence this is a superconducting string. But the current buildup would eventually stop because of dissipation. Given the fact that you have these heavy quarks produced after inflation with non-trivial Peche Quinn charges, you need to make sure that they don't overclose the universe, namely that they have to somehow decay into the standard model, which means that this heavy quark should have some kind of a power coupling that will allow them to decay into the standard model quarks. So what that in, in, in turn means that the, uh, the light quarks or Higgs can hit the zero mode on the string and basically knock them out into the bulk. And that would actually dissipate the current and charge buildup on the string. But this, this special effect would eventually stop below a certain temperature where the plasma would end up having a lower temperature than the mass of this heavy course it is supposed to knock out from the string. So you can go ahead and estimate the temperature, which is actually a relatively low, something like 100 GeV for typical parameters. Now, if you in, in addition assume that there could have been primordial magnetic field and early universe, and this is motivated by the fact that the origin of intergalactic magnetic field of the order of 10 microgauss is not understood, and possible primordial thoughts have been talked about, like coming from phase transition or inflation, electromagnetic phase transition, and so on. And if you do have strings moving in a magnetic field, Lorentz boost would make the magnetic field appear as the electric field in the rest frame of the string. And therefore that will lead to this current buildup I mentioned earlier. So the current would actually build up very quickly and, and it would eventually go to dissipation and loss, but the buildup is very quick. And once there is a current running on the string that would interact with this uh, electromagnetic plasma around it. So that would actually create a friction on the motion of strings. The strings would also become very quickly non relativistic And now the string doesn't move very freely to simplify its network, then it doesn't reach the scaling behavior and disappears much, much more slowly, leads to much more denser network than usual, and therefore eventually lead to much more axiom produced from the string decay. And we, for the purpose of the numerical estimate, we assume that primordial magnetic field appears instantaneously at a certain temperature, and that will lead to the axion buildup which is much, much bigger if you go to a higher primordial magnetic field as you expect from this quantitative argument. So the dark matter axion from misalignment might become subdominant compared to the axion coming from string. 
And even for a very low decay constant, like 10 to 7 GeV, you may already get a substantial amount of non relativistic axion to give you the right abundance for dark matter. So the range of the mass you'll be looking for will be drastically different in that situation. And once again, I'm showing how much enhancement you might get compared to typical dark matter estimate for misalignment versus this uh, uh, origin from the cosmic string. And so uh, this will be actually a very interesting source of a uh, axion coming from the string if there is a primordial magnetic field. So one minute left. So axion string is superconducting generically, which had been somehow lost in the literature, had been forgotten, but it's true. And such an axion string to be relevant for phenomenology, it needs to be produced after inflation, therefore requires minimal case VZ model other than DFSZ. If, if there's a primordial magnetic field in addition to the axion strings, it will lead to charge buildup, creates a friction in string motion, leads to much denser net for cosmic strings, and therefore enhances axion abundance. And the consequence of superconducting string had been started and look, looked at only very recently. So there could be well more other consequences of interest that has not been studied yet. So that's the end of my talk today. I finished right on time. Thank you. Toshi, thanks very much for your nice talk. So uh, I see, I think the first question by Pablo. Hi, thank you for the nice talk, Hitoshi. I was hey, wondering, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, sorry, yeah. So I was wondering whether there's uh, a possible source of this cosmic uh, action background at, at larger frequencies, let's say of the, order of, of the order of electron volts, because that would be interesting because maybe it could be seen in light shining through wall experiments that use lasers. So do you think there's any production mechanism of such large frequencies? So you're talking about this uh, first half of my talk, where I talk yeah, about the, the world of risk actions. Yeah. Okay, so I can show you the, some of the plots again. So here we talked about the axion energy only up to like, like a milli electron volt or so. Yes. But in principle, of course, from the axion decay, it just depends on the mass of the dark matter. And if dark matter mass is well above EV, of course that will lead to the axion, which is, has a more chromatic peak at the half the mass of the dark matter. So in this case, we didn't consider those, but in principle, that could exist. And we don't, are not aware of any experiments that would be looking for the axion frequency of the order of EV. That's why we didn't actually look at that. But if you are thinking about that kind of particular experiment in principle, that could be interesting. So source yeah. can be there, depending on the scenarios you come up with. Uh, the, the question to me is whether there's a, 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 a viable experimental strategy for it. Yeah, so in this case, it won't be a haloscope, but I was thinking of light shining through wall that they use lasers. So it would be nice to see whether you, in the regeneration cavity, you suddenly get actions that don't, do not come from the, from the laser you started with, but actually from this uh -huh. cosmic action background, right? I don't okay, know. Yeah, that's possible. Yep. That's definitely possible, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. That's a good idea, indeed, yeah. There's another question by Pamela. Thank you, Pablo. Hello, Hitoshi. Yeah. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, it's quite interesting to see how the primordial uh, the magnetic field can affect the stringed axion abundance. Um, uh -huh. My question is that the primordial sort of magnetic field will have some uh, you know, coherence scale, which will depend uh -huh. quite a lot on the origin. If it's from like a right. phase right. transition, it might have a very small uh, sort of coherence scale. And also it'll evolve in a kind of way that depends on turbulence in the early universe. Right. Have you right. looked at the effects of these on how the primordial magnetic field will interact with the string uh, you know, network? Because that could drastically change that interaction and then change the axion abundance. Yeah, for the plot I've shown today, we made a rather conservative assumption that the coherence length is only such that it can account for sort of the range we see in intergalactic magnetic field. So it's actually not uh, uh, very long. Uh, so that corresponds mm -hmm. something like on a megaphosic scale. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So um, this is related to you know the lower bounds on the intergalactic That's right. magnetic field right. from you know the Fermi observations. Exactly. Okay, great. That's the number mm -hmm. we use. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I'm afraid we have to short here, but we finished the questions. You're sharp on time for the popular talk. I think I hand over the chair to Olga Menon.